Hey YouTube, I'm gonna take a few minutes here to go over the Tonga volcanic eruption that took place earlier this year. I'm gonna see how it interfered with the atmosphere, how it could interfere with climate, crop growing, and you. Stay tuned. Scientists have discovered the true ferocity of a huge volcanic eruption off the coast of Tonga in January. Research ships have found that flows of debris stretching at least 80 kilometers across the seabed. Let's hear more from Tom Brata. A monstrous eruption which has left its mark on our planet. When Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai blew its top in January, it scattered water vapor and ash halfway to space and sent tsunami waves swelling out across the world. As we approach the one year anniversary of the Hunga Tonga volcanic eruption, I thought it would be only fitting that I make a video of it as I was doing some research on it as a uh, side project for a friend who also is a, is a YouTuber on the platform here. The Honga Tonga eruption took place from December 20th, 2021, which is when it started, and it went until January 15th, 2022. It was in the news for a little while there, but I don't know if you've noticed the news cycle in 2022 is all over the place, so it was out of the mass consciousness pretty quick. Now, for those of you who are a little confused geographically, Tonga, it's forgivable. It's kind of a little, little tiny island there. But the Tonga Islands are a few little volcanic islands, and they're situated next to Fiji, which is east of Australia and north of New Zealand. Now, this volcano was the largest eruption ever recorded, and the blast was heard 6,000 miles away in Alaska. So, give you a little idea there. It fired its ash plume 57 kilometers into the atmosphere, which is higher than any other volcanic eruption previously. It went all the way through the troposphere, all the way through the stratosphere and touch the mesosphere up there. No other volcanoes ever done that before. So this is this is a new one. Now, this volcano moves 10 cubic kilometers worth of debris. So just ocean floor, sand, gravel, rock, whatever. It moves 10 cubic kilometers of this stuff around. Now, I'm not sure how they come to this conclusion, but the New Zealand National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, NIWA, found three quarters of this debris was accounted for, while the remaining 2.5 cubic kilometers, they assume, was ejected into the atmosphere, which is several million Olympic swimming pools, to give you a bit of an idea there. Now, it wasn't just the ocean floor debris that was shot around. It also shot a bunch of sulfur dioxide up in the atmosphere, like all volcanoes do. The one silver lining here is compared to other previous massive eruptions, not that much sulfur dioxide was released. Most of it was kind of filtered out, like if there's... Mm, there's any potheads watching, kind of like a gravity bong or a water bong or something. The water actually grabbed the sulfur and filtered it out there. So only a little bit of sulfur actually got released in the atmosphere. Something like 20 times less than the amount from Pinatubo or previous massive eruptions. The one new thing with this volcano was, though, is that it released a massive amount of water vapor into the atmosphere. So basically just all this water that was down there that was exposed to this lava and this explosive eruption instantly vaporized, turned to, turns to steam. That steam then rised up so fast it just shot up through the atmosphere. Normally the stratosphere contains 1,500 teragrams of water 
now it contains 1,700 teragrams of water. So we've increased the water level in the stratosphere by over 10% just from this one eruption. Now we have seen record low cooling in the southern hemisphere from May to October. And this volcanic eruption took place at 20 degrees south latitude. Since then, the volcanic plume has spread over the entire world, and it's not just at 20 degrees latitude anymore. So as we go into the winter, in the northern hemisphere this winter, and especially as we're seeing energy crises in Europe and whatnot, this is definitely something we want to keep an eye on. So the next thing we have to ask ourselves here is how do volcanoes affect climate? And there's no short answer. It's a very complicated system. There's lots of different layers of the atmosphere. There's a lot of different currents in there. There's a lot of different compounds and molecules floating around. But it really boils down to the absorption and reflection spectrum of all these different compounds in there because you have solar energy coming in from the sun some of it goes through the atmosphere some of it gets absorbed some of it bounces off and flies back into space and then you also have terrestrial radiation where the, the earth actually absorbs a lot of the sunlight and then radiates it back out into space and a lot of that is caught by the atmosphere so how volcanoes change that is volcanoes eject a few different things into the atmosphere which can modulate this whole mathematical equation that we're dealing with. So the common one that people discuss is sulfur dioxide, SO2. But you also have ash and water vapor. In this case, sulfur dioxide isn't a huge deal. In the past it has been. Um, we saw in the Pinatuba eruption in 1991, we saw the temperature of the Earth decreased by one degree centigrade because of sulfur dioxide. And we saw about 10 years before that, El Chinchon, that eruption decreased the temperature by half a degree centigrade, and that was also because of sulfur dioxide. Um, we also have... Uh, historical incidents as in the uh, little ice age a lot of that cooling was driven by volcanic events and then we also had the the year without a summer krakatoa the famous scream painting was painted around that time and it was because of the red skies from the the backscatter that was due to all the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere it actually filtered out a lot of the sulfur the, the water molecules grabbed that sulfur dioxide and held it in the ocean so that didn't get out so much. But what did get out had a ton, many tons of water vapor that was released. 200 teragrams of water vapor was released into the stratosphere, which is a 10% increase in the amount of water in the stratosphere of the Earth. Why is that a big deal? So, Caltech actually was doing some studies this year, and Caltech determined that stratospheric water vapor could remain in the atmosphere for up to a decade. And it has some other knockoff effects also. It actually can decrease the ozone, which I know you've we've all heard about the, the ozone layer, a hole in the ozone layer, yada yada. But water vapor up there can actually act as a nucleus for ozone um, disintegration. It catalyzes the chemical reaction to decompose the O3 ozone into um, O2 oxygen gas. And water vapor can actually act as a catalyst for that. Water vapor, of course, creates clouds. Clouds also create atmospheric backscatter, which sends some of that solar energy back out into space. So less solar energy, less solar irradiance hitting the planet. Now it does also have a heating effect. 
So the water vapor does actually absorb a lot of this terrestrial radiation that the Earth is emitting. And so that, some of that water vapor will also absorb and then vibrate with the infrared wavelengths there, and it'll heat up. So you have you have this driving cooling and driving heating at the same time, and we're kind of hanging out to see which one's going to be more powerful or if they cancel each other out. So far, we're seeing cooling in the southern hemisphere, and we're just going to have to wait a couple months to see how it plays out in the northern hemisphere. Now, currently, the only way we have to measure water vapor in the stratosphere is by a satellite. We can measure some water in the troposphere for normal meteorology using ground-based measurements and weather balloons and whatnot, but the stratosphere is a bit too high for that, so we have to use satellites. That's what we rely on. The gold standard that I was able to find was the Aura MLS satellite, which is part of the swoosh data set, and that has been tracking uh, water vapor content in the stratosphere for the past few decades. Our satellite measurements really only go back to Pinatuba and El Chinchon in like the 80s. Before that, there's really nothing for us to go off. Now what the Aura MLS satellite found was that within two weeks of the eruption, this band of water vapor had completely encircled the globe from that eruption. Now it kind of sat in the 20 degree south latitude in that band for a while as the various currents in the atmosphere were kind of holding it there. But these currents move around seasonally. So over the course of the year, at first, it moved down to the southern, throughout the southern hemisphere to the south pole. And it also moved over the equator. And you can see that actually from these really telling Aura MLS um, graphs that they have released on uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory website. And you can see it moving month by month. You can compare it to the previous year. You can see at first it goes way up in elevation. And then the, the water vapor cloud kind of comes down, the ring kind of comes down a little bit, and you can see it right at that 20 latitude south marker. And then you can see it moving, starting to move its way over the equator until throughout the whole year, eventually it just totally encircles the globe. And it completed this encirclement about two weeks ago, so the very end of November, the last week of November, it completed this encirclement. And so now the entire globe is encircled by stratospheric water vapor that is literally off the charts. The satellite cannot measure any higher. So we're at the maximum measurement all the way around the globe. We don't know how high it actually is because it only goes up to that certain measurement. So NOAA was doing some studies in 2018 and they found that if you increase the stratospheric water vapor by 10%, it would also cause a 10% reduction in the loss of ozone because of the way that those water molecules are used as a catalyst for that ozone O3 to O2 reaction. And they also found that that increase in stratospheric water vapor would move the eddy currents from the jet stream uh, more towards the poles. So you can see more funny activity with polar vortices and everything. If they're correct in their studies, they said between them and Caltech, they said this could be around for 10 years. So we could see some serious atmospheric disruptions just from this one volcano. Don't not even counting, you know, greenhouse gases, solar minimum, all the other crazy things affecting the planet right now. Just from this one volcano, we could see some serious disruptions. So who knows how this is going to play out, honestly. When I was doing my research, and this is kind of just a summary of a few 
jumping off points. I'm not getting into all the details in this video. But when I was doing my research, I found that most people that are researching this don't really have a clear grasp of what exactly is going on here. A lot of people are researching one little piece of it. Not many people are combining all the macro factors. So this is definitely going to be a key variable to keep watch on over the coming years uh, for climate impacts. And then for what I'm more concerned about is actually the crop growing prospects over the next few years. You know, different crops, corn, wheat, sorghum, soybeans, etc. They require different wavelengths to come through. They require different solar intensities for them to grow. They require different rainfall patterns. And when you mess around with those rainfall patterns, and when you change the spectrum of solar irradiance that's reaching the Earth's surface due to all the scattering and absorption taking place in the atmosphere, then you're going to mess with the plants a little bit. So... That's kind of what we're digging into a little bit to see what the actual impact is going to be from that ultimately. But as of now, jury's still out. Just giving you guys a quick little update and uh, hope you guys find this interesting and maybe are inspired to do a little bit research for your own on the topic. All right, signing off.